invitation to Eric and I'm In invitation. It's really a, a pleasure and honor to be part of this session with this audience and joining two fabulous speakers and Dr. Gabay and Dr. Cannon, whose presentations I immensely enjoyed. And I think uh, it's interesting that as endocrinologists, cardiologists, and nephrologists, we're really coming together uh, around this concept of improving clinical outcomes for people with diabetes and uh, improving the complications of this disease. And I think you'll find that our recommendations continue to be highly aligned, that we're sending a, a similar message. Uh, my perspective comes from the kidney disease perspective uh, as introduced, and I'll be focusing on what are called the kidney disease improving global outcomes or KDGO guidelines. KDGO is the preeminent kidney, kidney guideline agency uh, internationally and they've recently issued diabetes and, and chronic kidney disease guidelines, which are being updated this year. And I'll give you a preview of some of the changes and recommendations and new recommendations, which Chris Cannon alluded to as well. Uh, here are my disclosures. I have consulted for a number of companies that make SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, and other uh, agents that I'll try to talk about in an unbiased and, and fair way. And I just want to take a few slides to address the question, what's the big deal about kidney disease? And the first answer to that is that kidney disease is common in both type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. And I'll show just one slide on that. On the left is from the DCCT edict study of type 1 diabetes, looking at the cumulative incidence of albuminuria by duration of type 1 diabetes. And you can see here that in the top line, uh, people who had in, uh, conventional diabetes therapy had a rapid increase in the incident in, in the prevalence of, uh, of, of albuminuria during the second decade of, of uh, type 1 diabetes, with a leveling off around 40%. Uh, with intensive diabetes therapy, that was reduced to about 25%. And on the right, you can see data from type 2 diabetes looking at the prevalence of chronic kidney disease, either uh, manifest as albuminuria or low EGFR or either one. And I'll focus on the left here, the either one column. Uh, this is stratified by the duration of type 2 diabetes. And you can see kidney disease prevalence is strongly related to the, prevalent, to the duration of diabetes and type 2 diabetes as well. Uh, exceeding 40% uh, with people who have had uh, 20 years of, of type 2 diabetes. And so from these sorts of data, and there are other cohorts as well, we generally say that about 40% of people with type 1 or type 2 diabetes eventually uh, develop kidney disease. And of course, uh, kidney disease is the most common cause of kidney failure in the world. These are data from the United States, the United States Renal Data System, um, showing the uh, incidence of new kidney failure requir requiring dialysis or a kidney transplant over time from 2000 to 2019. Diabetes is the leading cause, accounting for about half of all cases of kidney failure in the United States. Uh, it's a major impact for individuals who develop this and for the healthcare systems uh, in the U.S. and around the world. And even short of developing kidney failure, chronic kidney disease is a very strong risk factor for cardiovascular disease and mortality, as Chris pointed out. And these are data, to, again, from the United States, um, looking uh, at the association of kidney disease with all-cause mortality over 10 years. This is the absolute risk of, of death over 10 years of follow-up. Uh, according to diabetes and kidney disease status, the, the dotted line is the expected uh, 10 year mortality for people with no diabetes or no kidney disease. What you can see on the left side here is that people who have type 2 diabetes but no evidence of kidney disease do have a slightly increased risk of mortality, 4.1% excess risk. But that excess risk goes up dramatically with albuminuria, low EGFR, or particularly both manifestations of chronic kidney disease. And this is attributable. Uh, to atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk, myocardial infarctions and stroke, uh, as well as heart failure and other causes of cardiovascular death, uh, making the point that preventing cardiovascular uh, complications is really critical for people who have chronic uh, kidney disease. All right, so now I'm going to focus on these uh, uh, KDGO clinical practice guidelines. 
And uh, uh, KDGO, I noted, has uh, made a number of kidney disease guidelines over time, everything from kidney transplantation to glomerular diseases to complications of CKD like anemia. Uh, and they decided, given uh, this background that I've introduced and all of the new trials and drugs assessing diabetic kidney disease, that it was time for a, a, a diabetes and CKD guideline. And the, this was uh, uh, commissioned in 2017. Um, I had the honor of chairing it along with Peter Rossing, who is an endocrinologist from Denmark. And KDGO is very rigorous, uh, as is the ADA, in, in, in developing their clinical practice guidelines. Uh, we had a work group leading this that was quite diverse. In addition to nephrologists and endocrinologists, we had a cardiologist, a primary care doctor, a nutritionist, uh, a pharmacologist, uh, and two patients who were involved from the very beginning who kept our ground, our working very much grounded with a, a patient perspective. Uh, these experts uh, came from six different continents and had really deep and complementary expertise in, in endocrinology, nephrology, et cetera. And we were supported by the Cochrane Evidence Review Team from Australia. We did a very thorough evidence review uh, and uh, helped us assess the quality and strength of recommendations uh, using grade criteria. So the first guideline was in, uh, introduced in 2020, uh, published in Kidney International uh, in that year, and it really is quite comprehensive. Uh, it addresses comprehensive care of the whole patient uh, with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, uh, glycemic monitoring and targets, lifestyle interventions, antihyperglycemic therapy, and approaches uh, to management, including self-care and systems approaches. And uh, these are uh, uh, summarized using this pyramid, which has become somewhat emblematic of the guideline uh, here on the right. And I'm not going to go into this pyramid because after just two years with all of the new data that's come out, as you've heard from Dr. Gabay and Dr. Cannon and throughout the day, we felt the need to update this guideline in 2022. And we've taken a similar approach, uh, but updated the pyramid. This is not yet published, but will come out in the next month or two uh, in Kidney International. And you can see some themes that are quite similar to what you saw uh, in the prior lectures, including that comprehensive care for people with diabetes and chronic kidney disease should be based on a foundation of lifestyle, uh, you can see here diet, exercise, smoking cessation, uh, and weight. Uh, the, it should also include a foundation of first-line drug therapy for proven uh, drugs with proven benefits. You can see here metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors for people who have type 2 diabetes, as well as renin angiotensin system blockade for people with hypertension and statins, as Chris uh, nicely went over, with goal-directed therapy layered on top of that, including uh, for appropriate uh, uh, patients, and I'll go into this, GLP-1 receptor agonists and non steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, antiplatelet agents specifically named as uh, agents to consider. So obviously in uh, this talk, I can't go through the whole clinical practice guideline, but I do intend to touch uh, on lifestyle interventions, the foundation of this care, and then focus uh, largely on some of the newer classes of agents including uh, the evidence behind them and how to select patients and implement those uh, newer therapies and the changes that are coming in the 2022 guideline compared to the 2020 guideline. So there's a lot to consider uh, for uh, nutrition for patients who have both diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Mostly these patients hear about things that they're not supposed to eat and there can be recommendations on anything from carbohydrates to proteins uh, to micronutrients, uh, electrolytes like potassium and phosphate, et cetera. And so with discussion, we felt that the most important thing to do for this uh, population was to emphasize general eating principles of consuming what most would consider a heart healthy diet, which is also kidney healthy. And that is one that's uh, high in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, fiber, legumes, et cetera, and lower in processed meats, refined carbohydrates, and sweetened beverages. Uh, this is not rocket science, uh, but I think it's very important before telling patients uh, all of the details of what they can't do to provide an overall picture of, of what can be done. And as noted here, this is an international guideline, and it's very important 
to acknowledge individual cultures and preferences when instituting this sort of nutrition guidance, uh, as you can see in the figure. We do then have some specific recommendations about tailoring nutrition from there. And one is about dietary protein, which has received a lot of attention in the kidney disease world with the hope that lower protein diets might improve kidney outcomes by reducing stress in the kidneys. And in fact, clinical trials to date have not shown that dietary protein restriction markedly improves outcomes in humans. And so the guideline issues a recommendation to maintain a protein intake of about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. That is the World Health Organization recommended diet. So it's no different than people with, uh, um, with, without kidney disease or, or diabetes. Uh, and uh, we do recommend avoiding high protein, which uh, there are signals for, uh, for deleterious outcomes, except in the case of hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis patients who are catabolic and may lose protein for whom slightly higher protein intakes are recommended. We also recommend low sodium diets uh, and show, uh, as shown here, some approaches to reducing sodium in the diet uh, this is mainly to improve blood pressure and to improve cardiovascular outcomes, which I noted are critical for people with kidney disease. And also uh, physical activity is critical uh, for improving both kidney and cardiovascular outcomes. And I won't go through all of these. Our recommendations are consistent with the American Heart Association and other organizations to try and exercise cumulatively about 150 minutes per week. Uh, tailored to uh, uh, patients' uh, comorbidities, fall risks, uh, et cetera. Well, what about drug therapy? And I have only one slide. I think you're all aware of uh, the importance of renin angiotensin system in inhibition for people with chronic kidney disease, and Chris covered this as well. Uh, there were really three uh, critical, pivotal trials of establishing RAS inhibition as important for people with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. One was the Captopril collaborative study in type 1 diabetes, not shown here. And then in type 2 diabetes, uh, the Renal study on the left and the IDNT study on the right. All three of these trials enrolled people with high blood pressure, heavy albuminuria, uh, and looked at uh, an ACE or an ARB compared with placebo, or in the case of the IDNT, also an active comparator, and amlodipine and looked at the risk of chronic kidney disease progression and found uh, modest but clinically important and statistically significant reductions in progression. For example, 16% reduction uh, with uh, low sartan in the Renal study and a 20% reduction in CKD progression uh, with herbisartan um, in, uh, in the IDNT study. So we make a very clear recommendation that for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes patients, if you have hypertension and albuminuria, a RAS inhibitor needs to be part of the treatment regimen to prevent and slow uh, the risk of, of kidney function decline. Now, one thing I also want to point out on the slide is the large residual risk of patients with these characteristics. At four years in the Renal study, even in the Losartan group, half of patients had substantial kidney disease progression. This is doubling of creatinine, kidney failure, et cetera, similar in the IDNT study. And so RAS inhibition alone does not prevent, uh, substantially prevent kidney disease progression among people uh, at high risk. And so this is why SGLT2 inhibitors have become so important. And as I alluded to in the pyramid, really part of the new standard of care for people with diabetes, with type 2 diabetes uh, and chronic kidney disease. And Chris introduced these trials, and I think you heard them earlier today as well. There are now 11 published uh, high-quality clinical outcome studies with SGLT2 inhibitors, with two additional ones, Deliver and Empikidney, that have been stopped with, uh, uh, for benefit, and results are pending this year. That will be 13 such trials, really a wealth of evidence looking at the effects of SGLT2 inhibitors on the kidney and cardiovascular system. I tend to lump these trials into three categories. In blue are the cardiovascular outcome studies that enrolled people with type 2 diabetes and high atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk and looked at ASCVD outcomes. In yellow, the heart failure trials, which enrolled people with heart failure with or without type 2 diabetes and looked at heart failure outcomes. 
And in green, uh, the CKD studies, which enrolled people with chronic kidney disease with or without type 2 diabetes and looked at primary kidney disease outcomes. Uh, one ex exception there is SCORED, which enrolled people with chronic kidney disease but look looked at cardiovascular outcomes. And Chris uh, nicely summarized these results as well, so I'll go through this rather quickly. But the benefits of these drugs are impressive, and they do appear to be a class effect. I agree with uh, the question asked at the end of the last lecture and Chris's response to that. Here um, is the, um, uh, the effect of SGLT2 inhibitors and meta-analysis on heart failure or cardiovascular death. It's grouped first by the category of study, heart failure, uh, CVOTs, and chronic kidney disease studies. And you can see quite um, uh, consistent reductions in heart failure across the populations and within each population across the drugs within those populations, and a 23% reduction in that outcome uh, shown here, also an 11% reduction in major atherosclerotic cardiovascular uh, events. And very importantly, and one of the reasons that uh, kidney disease is focused on this class of drugs so, uh, so heavily is the 36% reduction in chronic kidney disease progression uh, defined by substantial reductions of EGFR or kidney failure. That's a very large effect. And again, uh, a class effect uh, with, with some outliers, um, but generally uh, um, a, a class effect, uh, strong differences in, in, in reductions in cardiovascular death as well. So the, the KDGO recommendation for SGLT2 inhibitors is to treat uh, all patients with type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease defined as either elevated albuminuria or low EGFR, and an EGFR of 20 mils per minute with an SGLT2 inhibitor, and that's given the highest level of evidence uh, and, and strength of recommendation with, with 1A. So uh, in other words, we're recommending SGLT2 inhibitors for the whole heat map uh, of, of chronic kidney disease classification. And that's because these studies that I've described really have covered this heat map with the cardiovascular outcome study uh, covering people with uh, all levels of albuminuria and EGFR of 30 or more, um, the credence uh, and DAPA CKD studies really enhancing uh, the, the, the evidence for people with high levels of albuminuria and high uh, chronic kidney disease uh, risk uh, scored, uh, and the EMPEROR trials, uh, both pushing down the level of EGFR for eligibility and including patients with lower EGFR, uh, which we'll also see uh, when, when data come out from the EMPA kidney study. So there's oftentimes questions about, well, what do you do with people who have chronic kidney disease and uh, with low EGFR but no albuminuria? Well, they're included in this recommendation, both for the kidney and cardiovascular benefits, and there's abundant data to support that. I will note uh, that the 20 mil per minute threshold is something that comes up a lot as well, and that's new from 2020. In the 2020 guideline, KDGO uh, suggested initiating SGLT2 inhibitor down to 30 mils per minute. In the 2022 guideline, we recommend initiating down to 20 mils per minute. And why is that? The first bullet is probably most important here. Glycemia lowering decreases as EGFR goes down. That's because less glucose is filtered when GFR is low. However, uh, the benefits and risks of SGLT2 inhibitors with regard to kidney and cardiovascular outcomes are preserved across all levels of EGFR and all levels of albuminuria, for that matter. And so despite lower glucose lowering efficacy, the, the clinical benefits are maintained. And then you can see, and I won't read through each of these bullets, but uh, uh, new trials have included people with lower EGFRs. Post-hoc analyses of previously uh, published trials have also demonstrated clinical benefits uh, of, of these drugs, um, uh, even at low EGFRs. And in the last bullet, uh, I'll note that several trials, uh, while they uh, have thresholds for inclusion of participants and starting in SGLT2 inhibitors, the clinical trial protocols included maintaining the patient's on study drug, even if the, if the EGFR dipped below the eligibility threshold. And in fact, that's how the KDGO guidelines recommend implementation of SGLT2 inhibitors for people with progressive chronic kidney disease, that is continuing the drug uh, as long as it's tolerated even below this initiation threshold. 
There are a number of practice points guiding the implementation of SGLT2 inhibitors. They're summarized in this slide, and I'll just pick out a few to note. First, in the upper right, um, uh, in follow-up of initiation of an SGLT2 inhibitor, a small dip in EGFR is commonly seen and should be anticipated and is generally not a reason to stop an SGLT2 inhibitor. How much of a dip is okay? Usually uh, up to about 30% seems to be okay based on post hoc analyses of the EMPA-REG and Cretans trials. I'll also note uh, in these bottom two rows that in general, SGLT2 inhibitors can be safely and effectively added to existing regimens for glycemic management and uh, volume control. Uh, as was done in all of these trials. However, patients who are at high risk of hypoglycemia or volume depletion may need attention to concomitant medications that could cause hypoglycemia or volume depletion, such as diuretics. So more broadly, the KDGO guideline has this diagram to help guide in, uh, in, uh, in glucose lowering drugs for patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. It suggests that glucose lowering should be based again on lifestyle uh, and that first line therapy should be, uh, should include an SGLT2 inhibitor um, uh, down to an EGFR of 20 as, as noted here, as well as metformin. Uh, further discussion goes uh, and suggests that both metformin and SGLT2 inhibitor are logical co-first line therapies for most patients with this combination of, of conditions. That's consistent with what Dr. Gabay suggested for his first patient, even uh, though that patient didn't have chronic kidney disease. I think if that patient had had chronic kidney disease, the combination of metformin and SGLT2 inhibitor would have been particularly compelling in that case example. And then uh, for patients who need additional drug therapy to control uh, hemoglobin A1C, glycemia, um, that should be guided by patient preferences, comorbidities, EGFR, and costs. But a GLP-1 receptor agonist is recommended and preferred uh, for potential kidney benefits, but mainly for the cardiovascular benefits that Chris outlined as well. I do want to comment on glycemic monitoring briefly. And there's one recommendation in the KDGO guideline that seems quite basic, but is important. And that is recommending hemoglobin A1C to monitor glycemic control in patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Uh, why is it important to make such a basic recommendation? Well, there's a widely recognized bias in hemoglobin A1C in people with advanced chronic kidney disease, particularly patients treated with dialysis. And in the lower right here, you can see some of the reasons that patients treated with dialysis have a falsely low hemoglobin A1C on average. We conducted a review of the literature and found that hemoglobin A1C actually performs quite well down to an EGFR of about 30 mils per minute, after which it becomes a little less precise. And then in the dialysis population, bias low is noted here. It's important though that most patients with, chronic, with diabetes and chronic kidney disease uh, do have EGFRs more than 30 and hemoglobin A1C should continue to be used. We discuss in the guideline that directly measuring blood glucose, for example, with CGM is a very valuable uh, adjunct in this population, very logical. There haven't been a lot of studies conducted in the dialysis or advanced chronic kidney disease patients uh, but that is a logical alternative uh, when hemoglobin A1C is not uh, performing well. Like the ADA, the KDGO guidelines recommend a spectrum of individualized hemoglobin A1C targets, including uh, potentially quite aggressive targets for patients who have few comorbidities and, uh, and a low risk of hypoglycemia. And of course, these lower targets are facilitated by the new medications that can effectively control blood glucose with low risk of, of hypoglycemia. Patients who have more comorbidities and more risk of hypoglycemia, as in the ADA, uh, are recommended to have uh, higher hemoglobin A1C targets. I'd like to talk more about GLP-1 receptor agonists today, but for the sake of time, I only have one slide. And there is a lot going on in this field, as, as Chris said, with a lot of studies looking at the kidney effects of GLP-1 receptor agonists and one outcome study underway. 
I do want to summarize uh, some of the effects of GLP-1 receptor agonists from clinical outcome studies and note first um, that most of these have had major atherosclerotic cardiovascular events as the primary outcomes, and many of these studies have shown benefits, uh, and, and Chris summarized that data very nicely. Most of these studies have also looked at kidney outcomes as secondary outcomes and found benefit, mostly with regard to albuminuria reduction. Albuminuria reduction is an important uh, uh, intermediate outcome for kidney disease, but it is not an accepted surrogate outcome or a clinical outcome. And what we tend to want to see to really promote uh, new drugs is uh, a benefit with regard to EGFR loss. And as you can see in the second to right column here, in the secondary analysis of these trials, we've had not clear evidence uh, of, of whether GLP-1 receptor agonists will in the long-term slow EGFR loss. The FLOW trial is a trial currently underway to address that more rigorously. Uh, and we're hopeful, based on some of the provocative data, including um, uh, benefits in the rewind style for uh, trial for dulaglutide, that we'll see benefits there that will further uh, promote the use of GLP-1 receptor agonists in this population. Chris noted uh, there's a new agent on, on the scene, and that's finerenone. And I will talk about that in a little bit more detail. And uh, finerenone was evaluated in a pair of sister trials called Fidelio DKD and Figaro DKD. This is a visual abstract showing the results of the Fidelio DKD trial. Uh, it was a double blind trial enrolling people with type 2 diabetes who were uh, treated with RAS blockade and had an EGFR of 25 to 75 um, with albuminuria. That was a key eligibility criteria because albuminuria is such a risk factor for chronic kidney disease progression and cardiovascular events. For Fidelio DKD, the primary outcome was kidney failure, was, uh, or, or a kidney composite, which included kidney failure, sustained decrease of EGFR 40% or more, or death from kidney disease, and that was significantly reduced by 18%. A key secondary composite outcome uh, which was MACE plus heart failure was reduced by 14%, also statistically significant, uh, with a modest increase in hyperkalemia, a known adverse event for mineral alcohol receptor antagonists. Um, there were no uh, deaths due to, to hyperkalemia in the trial. I won't show results for the Figaro DKD trial, uh, except to note that it was also a type 2 diabetes population treated with RAS blockade. Uh, it was at higher cardiovascular risk and lower uh, kidney risk. Also, everybody had albuminuria. Uh, the outcomes were reversed, and, and the cardiovascular outcome was the primary outcome, and it was significantly reduced. And in my mind, this really um, validated uh, the, 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 the effects seen in Fidelio DKD. So there is a new recommendation in the 2022 KDGO guideline uh, uh, suggesting a non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist with proven kidney or cardiovascular benefit. Uh, right now, that's just venerinone for patients who have type 2 diabetes, an estimated GFR of 25 mils per minute or more, normal serum potassium concentration, and albuminuria despite maximum, maximum tolerated dose of RAS inhibitor. And that's given a 2A uh, level of recommendation. Uh, and I view the most likely and most appropriate application of, of this drug uh, as uh, layering on top of, of standard of care therapy, which includes a RAS inhibitor, which is explicitly stated here, and probably also on top of an SGLT2 inhibitor, for which we now have uh, such uh, incredible evidence and, uh, um, and, and including that in, in the standard of care. And I'll note, uh, as noted in the bottom here, that um, a non steroidal MRA can be added to a RAS and an SGLT2 inhibitor. Subgroup analyses suggested that the benefits of non steroidal MRA uh, uh, were similar with or without the presence of an SGLT2 inhibitor uh, at baseline. I noted that hyperkalemia is the most common problem with finerenone treatment, as with other MRAs like spironolactone. And so there's guidance about how to appropriately select people. Uh, um, for to reduce the risk of hyperkalemia and for monitoring throughout the trial. Uh, essentially, uh, we recommend that uh, you select patients with potassium of 4.8 millimoles per liter or, or lower and have regular monitoring 
with dose adjustments and holding finerenone as needed uh, throughout treatment. It is very important to think beyond lifestyle and drugs uh, to other ways to improve outcomes in this high-risk population. And self-care is, of course, very important. And the KDGO guidelines uh, take a nod to the ADA guidelines in recommending structured self-management education programs to improve diabetes knowledge, self-management, reduce uh, risk factors for complications, uh, and, uh, and improve emotional and mental well-being for patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. This is an important aspect of care not to be overlooked. And uh, these are complex patients, as, as Dr. Gabay and Dr. Cannon said nicely. And in order to effectively deliver the interventions that we now have that are effective, we really need uh, systems-level approaches, uh, integrated care, supported uh, by decision makers and delivered by a diverse group of providers to identify appropriate patients uh, for implementing these therapies and getting them to the people who need them most to improve outcomes for the population. I'm going to summarize, uh, or before I summarize, I'm going to note that there are a lot of clinical practice guidelines out there. Uh, this can be overwhelming, and sometimes people focus uh, on what they perceive as differences in the guidelines uh, to, to suggest that there are, are problems um, um, or reasons not to implement these. And I want to start uh, by noting that uh, there are, indeed there are a lot of guidelines out there. They really are, in my mind, uh, quite similar, uh, complementary, uh, and aligned. And recognizing this potential concern, um, KDGO and the ADA partnered over the last year to write a consensus statement about management of patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And our charge really was to look at the two guidelines, the standard of care for 2022 and the KDGO guideline uh, for 2022, and, uh, and look and see where they're aligned, where there are any discrepancies. And I'll say they're almost fully aligned. Uh, and you heard, uh, I think, similar statements and recommendations from Dr. Gabay, Dr. Cannon, uh, and I, and um, and I, they really are pointing towards the, the same direction. This is a flow diagram that the group came up with um, to highlight the high priority shared recommendations from the two organizations. Uh, it looks familiar to what you saw uh, in Dr. Gabay and Dr. Cannon's presentations and uh, sort of like the pyramid that I showed in the beginning of this talk, but the other way around from, from top to bottom. And uh, notably, uh, as always, management uh, rests on lifestyle modification. There are important first-line drug therapies that are proven uh, to improve outcomes, and those include for all patients uh, statins. This is all patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease, I should emphasize statins, uh, RAS inhibitors for people with albuminuria hypertension, for people with type 2 diabetes who are shown in this color box here, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors um, with metformin are considered uh, first-line therapies, uh, regular reassessment of intermediate targets including glycemia, um, blood pressure, lipids, as well as cardiovascular risk, and albuminuria, as Dr. Gabay noted, is important to guide additional risk-based therapy. And you can see that GLP-1 receptor agonists, non steroidal MRAs, uh, and some of the important cardiovascular agents that Chris was talking about, antiplatelet agents, zetamide, PCSK9 inhibitors, et cetera, are, are um, recommended in that uh, alignment as, as well. So this, I hope, is a useful figure. It will be published in the next uh, couple of months that summarizes some of the high-priority uh, consensus approaches to improving outcomes for people with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And with that, I'll stop and summarize. Um, I'll note that uh, this KDGO guideline, uh, the 2020 version is currently available. The 2022 uh, will be published in the next couple of months. It really does provide recommendation and practice for point, points on a, a wide range of, of care for people with diabetes and CKD. It includes lifestyle management as a foundation of care. SGLT2 inhibitors really now are part of the standard of care for type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Uh, with new guidance for GLP-1 receptor agonists and non steroidal MRAs, self-management and systems levels uh, uh, approaches are, are critical. 
And I want to thank uh, all of you in the audience for, for listening to this talk, the organizers for inviting me, and the KDGO work group for all the work they put into uh, these guidelines that I presented today. Thank you.